Just a few uh, items before I start into my message this morning. There's um, uh, some significant prayer requests out there for health concerns that people, different people are having. Um, so um, we're just going to bow before the Lord and, and just ask God's hand to move in, in different people's lives. Lord, we, we come to you with hearts of thankfulness, Lord, for what you are, who you are, uh, what you do. And Father, you hear the cries of our hearts. So Lord, this morning there's just different, different people in our congregation that aren't with us this morning because they're sick. And even those that are here, there's some that are very ill. So we just pray for them, Lord. We pray for, uh, thank you for your church, Lord. Thank you that we can gather here this morning and we can hold each other up in prayer. And Lord, if there's anyone that I've forgotten to mention that's not feeling well, we just pray that you would bless them right now, even as we're, we're speaking. And I pray for uh, also, also for my mother and father-in-law that they've come here from Winnipeg. And uh, mom's sick this morning too, so I just pray that you'd, you'd help her as well. Father, God, we come to your word this morning and ask, God, that you would, you would teach us by it, Lord, that you give me strength as we continue in the book of Judges to be able to, to preach the word that po folks will be able to see lessons and things in their own lives, Father, that they can apply. And God, I just pray that you would, you would just you would cause your word to prosper in the hearts of your people and give me strength and anointing to be able to preach it in a way that's honoring and pleasing to you. And we praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this morning, um, we're going to continue in the book of Judges. And um, we see uh, time and time again, there's a, a repetition in this book of things that happened in Israel and things that God wants to get our attention on. And I believe that there's many parallels. Um, so here we have another chapter in Judges. And again, the Israelites ignored their worship of God and their hearts turned to serve idols, the idols that were worshipped by the Canaanites. Now, during the time of the Judges, there was a land called Midian. And the Midianites were distant relatives of the Israelites. They were actually, um, many people don't know this, but after Sarah, Abraham's wife, died, he had Isaac and Ishmael, but he, had, he married another woman after that, and she bore other children to Abraham. And one of those children that were born from Abraham's wife, Keturah, was uh, Midian. In Genesis chapter 25, verses 1 to 6, we see the Bible says, Abraham had taken another wife whose name was Keturah. She bore him Zimran, Josh, Joshkan, Midian, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Jokshan was the father of Sheba and Dedan. The descendants of Dedan were the Asherites, the Leshuites, and the Lemuites. The sons of Midian were Epha, Epher, Hanak, Abida, and Elda. All these were descendants of Keturah. And I wanted to read this because this is significant. Abraham, Abraham left everything he owned to Isaac. He gave some gifts to the others, but he left everything he owned to Isaac. Needless to say, there was some tension between uh, family members. And in the 800 years or so from the time of Abraham to the time in history where we're approaching the book of Judges, the Midianites had become a very large and powerful people group, and they were one of the enemies of the people of Israel. So we're continuing our exploration this morning in the topic of overcoming our spiritual enemies, and this is part two of a part three mini-series in Judges. So would you turn with me in your Bibles to Judges chapter 6. We're going to be introducing uh, you this morning to the life and ministry of Gideon. Judges chapter 6, starting with verse 1. 
The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them or their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. So we see, although the Israelites were the children of Isaac, they had been called by God to be the people that would represent him to the earth. Although they had been given revelation from the law of God through Moses, although God delivered them from Egypt miraculously and took them through desert lands, although they were given possession of the land of promise in Canaan, Sadly, the Israelites did not think the knowledge of God supernaturally revealed to them was worthwhile to retain. And because of this, God gave them over to the desires of their own heart to do the things that ought not to be done. And what they did was they mingled the worship of the one true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they proceeded to adopt and worship the false gods of Canaan, Baal, Asherah, and Moloch. And because of the wickedness the people were pursuing, and the depraved thinking that they had given themselves into, God withdrew his protection from the nation of Israel. And he permitted their Midianite enemies to overpower them. Now, the Midianites, they were nomadic people. They roamed in the desert country in the region just outside of the borders of the promised land that God gave to Israel. And the land that the Israelites were possessing at this time, it was literally an oasis in the desert, an oasis of bounty. And the Midianites wanted to lay claim to its resources for their own Israelite uh, uh, resources that had grown and they saw this land, and they thought, we're going to take it. Well, it's well known throughout the scriptures of the Old Testament, and these lessons are given to us repetitively over and over again, that whenever God's people make a decision to abandon or compromise the worship of the Lord and blend their commitment to the Lord with other gods, worship of other gods. Whenever they let idolatry take root, God's blessing and protection were removed and God permits his enemies to overcome and oppress his people. When Israel was following the Lord and was obedient to him, and actually during the course of the judges, there was great periods of time where a judge would come and they would turn their hearts towards the Lord and they would follow him and there was great periods of time of protection and blessing from the Lord. But it seemed as though those provisions and the protection over them lasted only as long as the Israelites were committed to serving the Lord wholeheartedly. As soon, sadly as it is, as soon as time went by, and people began to take the comfort of their living and their systems of doing things and their safety for granted, they began to take comfort in the prosperity they had and the safe lifestyle they were living and began to believe 
that it was because they had done something so good in themselves that they received this bountiful thing that they were inheriting. They began to be thinking that maybe there were other reasons besides Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that they were succeeding, that they were prospering. And they let their hearts stray and turn away from the living God And they rejected the leadership of God over them and they began to do what was right in their own eyes disregarding the word of the Lord over them. They fashioned idols of their own making out of material things and began to worship the false gods like the Canaanites worshipped Baal, Asherah, and Molech. And these false gods had ceremonies associated to the worship of them and the Israelites compromised with those ceremonies, and they began in pagan revelry to disregard the word of God. And when they did, when they did, God sent warnings to them to turn from wickedness. But they were so hard-hearted and double-minded that they were unwilling to leave their false gods behind. And as a result of this disobedience and rebellion, God removed his protection from them, along with the lie and illusion that sin is actually beneficial to enrich our lives. See, that's the lie of the enemy, is that sin is actually there, and if we pursue it, it'll make our lives so much better. It'll enrich us. And the Scripture tells us that those who follow the path of sin rather than the path of the Lord This pathway, every single time, leads to spiritual plundering, captivity, and poverty. And in the case of the Israelites, it was physical. So the physical enemy of Israel is a parallel, I guess you would say, of the spiritual enemy of all of God's people throughout all generations. The enemy has no care or concern for the lives or the well-being of the people of Israel. Midianites couldn't care less about them. All they were thinking about was plunder. Well, just like in spiritual parallel, the devil, our enemy, has no concern for the well-being of people of God. All he is bent on doing is interrupting the blessing of God and plundering our lives. He's got no concern for us. The enemy of the spirit of man today is like the Midianite to Israel. The Bible calls our spiritual enemy a thief. When God the Son walked with us, he told the disciples in John 10.10, he said this, the thief comes only to still, steal, and kill, and destroy. Isn't that what the Midianites were doing to Israel? But Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and may have it to the full. So God permitted the Midianite thieves to have their way with the people of Israel. And it's inevitable when oppression is upon a people that they're impoverished. They're hurting to the point where they cried out to God. They cried out to God in despair. And, you know, some people get the wrong picture of God. God could have just left them to their own devices. After all, it was they who turned their back on God. God had never turned their back on them. They turned their back on God. And he could have just left them to their rebellious tendencies and their unfaithfulness to the point where they were actually destroyed and their nation was erased off the face of the earth. But God, being gracious, did not allow Israel to be destroyed and lose their national identity. No. He heard their hearts cry for help and he came to them with a solution. You see, human nature is the same. Whether it's 3,000 years before Christ or it's 2,000 years before Christ, or the time of Christ, or the time of the Middle Ages, or now. Human nature is the same. 
We are all alike under sin. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. One minute we're thankful. The next minute we're complaining. One minute we're kind to others. The next minute we hurry past someone in need. One minute we surrender all to God and the next minute we're seeking control of our own lives and pushing God away, putting other things before Him and getting all of our priorities mixed up and wrong. Paul says it really well. What a wretched man am I who will deliver me from this body of death. See, those who have come to God through Jesus Christ under the new covenant, we have been grafted into the root of faith in the patriarchs. You see, we're spiritually adopted into the family of God by the grace of God. And and as such, we're God's children. We're children of the Lord. And like Israel, we have been called to take a land of promise and to inhabit it, but not to let enemies thrive and live there, but to expel them. We have been called to have allegiance to the Lord our God. And like Israel, to the extent of our personal surrender to the Lord, to that extent will we find peace in the land that he has given us. Where there is no surrender, there is no peace. Let me tell this to you again. Where there is no surrender, there is no peace. Even as a believer, when we enter into a relationship with the Lord Jesus and he comes inside of us and he establishes his kingdom in us, he tells us to live and dwell and he bleeds us into this land of spiritual promise, a land flowing with milk and honey. If we choose to walk in a way that is apart from him when he calls us to obey, there is no no peace. There is no peace. There is only oppression. Because God loves us too much to let us get away with it. If we commit spiritual adultery with the idols of the world around us, who are not the children of God, placing other things and activities or even people above our relationship with God and His kingdom work, if our priorities get that misaligned, God loves us too much to let us get away with it. He will allow us to be impoverished by our spiritual enemies, just like he did with Israel and the Midianites in the book of Judges. These enemies will loot. They will steal our peace. They will steal our joy, rob us of our joy, and plunder our inheritance in the spiritual land of promise. To the point where we will find ourselves completely barren and impoverished in the spirit and living in fear. There's been times in my life, I I had a period of time in my life where I went through a period of darkness like what I'm explaining here, and it was not because of God, it was because of my own decisions. And it was a dark season of the soul. I was a believer, yes, but I was oppressed. I was a believer, yes, but I didn't have the joy of the Lord as my strength anymore. I was living in a chaotic state of fear. But God had mercy. And God will have mercy on you if you admit that you need him. You see, the Israelites, let's continue in verse 7 of our text. When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, He sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hands of the Egyptians. The hand of the Egyptians. And I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live. But you have not listened to me. How, pro- how common is it us, for us as people to cry out to God when we have given land to the enemy? 
when we have compromised our standards, when we have forged unholy alliances, how common is it for us when we abandon obedience to God and do things our own way only to discover that our disobedience opens us up to spiritual attack from the Midianites, from the enemies of our soul. The Midianites were no friends of Israel. The world, the ungodly world and its system that we live in, the sinful flesh that we carry with us from Adam, and the spiritual darkness and the devil and his demons. Friends, they are no, they are no friends of ours. They are not friends of ours. You're my friends. We're friends of the Lord. But these things are not our friends. And if we make alliances with them, there will be a price to pay. The Israelites' hearts wandered from truth. Their flesh was enticed by the pagan practices and the, the sins of the flesh, the rituals. They were duped into thinking that sacrificing their children on the altar of pleasure rather than of God would prosper their lives, protect them. The, the children of Israel were convinced to take their children and sacrifice them to Baal. They were tempted to go to the high places and offer themselves to prostitutes and prostitute themselves and commit gross immorality. This was the religion of the Canaanites. And the enemy did what enemies do. Their hopes were built on faulty foundations when they took their eyes off of the Lord. There was no protection. The enemy robbed, pillaged, and oppressed them in the spirit and in the physical, in the case of the Israelites, stealing the good provisions of the promised land that God had given them to possess. It's no different for us today. The things that we put as priorities above the Lord our God, we suppose that they will bring our, us and our families prosperity because that's what the world tells us it will do. But instead, what we find ourselves doing is giving our land to the enemy and he pillages it. And in the end, we end up oppressed and distant from the Lord our God. But God has a plan of redemption to teach his people about the super superiority of his ways versus the ways that are controlled by sin and the sin nature. See, this redemption plan is given to God's people despite the fact that God's people sometimes don't even want it or don't even realize that they need it. Some people cry out to God because the impoverishment in their life is so great, but they don't even recognize the impoverishment in their lives spiritually is brought on by their disobedience to the Lord. The direct connection is there, but it's not always seen. So God heard the cries of the people. They said, God, help us. Save us from the oppression of the Midianites. So he decided to intervene because God is gracious. And God loved his people. And he was going to, again, give them another chance. The Lord came to them. Verse 11, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the yoke in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abazite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. So you imagine if you were Gideon here. Those Midianites were taking everything. And here he is hiding in this wine press, beating out the stalks of grain so he could get some food for his family. Now the Abrazites, Bezerites, I guess you'd call them, 
were one of the ten clans identified as belonging to the tribe of Manasseh. And for those of you who need to understand that, Manasseh was a half-tribe along with Ephraim that came from the line of Joseph. It was the tribe of Joseph. Ephraim and Manasseh. So the Abazites were one of the ten clans identified as belonging to the tribe of Manasseh. Isn't that interesting? The lineage of Joseph, the tribe of Joseph. So you see, God came to Gideon, who was Joseph's great, 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 great grandson. Maybe another great in there somewhere. 800 years. I find this very interesting. We know the story of how God used Joseph to deliver the rest of his family from a desperate famine by bringing in Joseph to Egypt and actually making Joseph the prime minister of Egypt during that time. Joseph, the most unlikely, the youngest in the clan of the family, God made him a ruler to deliver his people out of the hands of the famine that was sweeping over the land. So here we have another Christophany that appears in the Scripture. Remember last, for, for those of you who weren't here last week, the angel of the Lord, in this case that's mentioned here in the Scripture, is not merely a servant angel, a messenger. But it is actually angel as in image, appearance of God himself, representation of God, not messenger. He was a messenger, but he was actually the representation of God. Or in English, we say the angel of the Lord appearing to Gideon in human form. And when God appeared to people in human form, we believe that it was not God the Father, but God the Son, because nobody can see the face of God the Father and live. So we believe that this is what they call a Christophany, where Jesus, before he come down to the earth and was born of Mary, appeared to Gideon. God saw this weak man hiding in a wine press, working hard to glean a little bit of food. He was hiding out of fear for the Midianites. And isn't it interesting that God calls Gideon mighty warrior? That's how he addresses him. Mighty warrior! Hmm. See, God had heard the cry of his people. And because he was merciful, he de de decided to visit a weak, seemingly insignificant man to be the conduit for his plan to rout the marauding Midianites from the land of Israel. Isn't that just like the Lord? Gideon was confused. He's like, he certainly didn't feel like he was a mighty warrior. He felt as though he had very little to offer and, and that he was barely hanging on. And, and we see him say this in verse 13 of our text. He says, pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? Where is all the wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. See, at first here, Gideon, Gideon was confused. He understood that God was there, but he also understood that he and his people we're in a defeated place. He understood it. It was apparent to Gideon. It appeared as though God had completely abandoned them. How often as children did our parents let us suffer the consequences of our decisions to teach us a lesson? If we had good parents, you bet. You would receive sometimes consequences for silly decisions you made, bad decisions you made, and your parents sometimes would just let you have to live it through. And why would your parent do that? Parent, if, if you have a good parent, your parent wouldn't do that just to make you suffer or because they didn't care. No, a good parent does that because they love the child. They love the child, and they want the child to learn a valuable lesson that cannot necessarily be learned any other way than to actually experience the pain that comes through disobedience. Hmm. 
Sometimes a loving God allows his protection to be withdrawn from us so that we learn. So that we learn. You see, God's correction with his people is his way of showing us his hatred of sin and his love for us. Consider what the Lord tells us today under his new covenant word by the word to the writer of the Hebrews who wrote this in Hebrews 12, 5 to 11. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, do not, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord loves the one, or disciplines the one he loves, and he ch chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you're not, not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while for our own good in order that we might share in his holiness. No discipline. Oh, sorry. They disciplined us for a while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant, at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. <sighs> Sometimes we feel like Gideon, though, don't we? We know that we are sinners all too well. Yet God calls us by name. God calls us saints. He calls us the saints and then he consecrates us to partner with him in his holy work to destroy the enemy that is actually plundering us. Even though we're to blame for the occupation in the first place. How merciful. At the time of his call, Gideon didn't see why God would call him or why it was even possible for him to be used by God for the Lord's purposes. He didn't see it. He understood that he was a sinner. He understood that he was impoverished and living in fear, but he didn't understand that God considered him as his child, and in the circumstances of defeat, God called him to become a mighty warrior, to rise up and to overthrow the oppression of the Midianites in his strength as he led. God called him to have faith and to trust him. And the Lord turned to him in verse 14 and, and said, Go in the strength that you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. And the Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, needing, leaving none alive. Gideon was so shocked when he heard this call. He wasn't sure what to do with it. How would it be possible for God's call on him to rise and fight the enemy? How could this call be real? Gideon thought to himself, I must be seeing something other than God. Even though the angel of the Lord was standing right before him, he's like second guessing it. He's like, I must be seeing something else. Maybe I'm seeing something else. I don't know what I'm seeing. This can't be for real. How could God choose me and call me mighty warrior? Are you kidding? Look at me. Gideon replied, if I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. Please don't go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. And Gideon went inside, prepared a young goat, and from an ephah of flour he made bread without yeast putting the meat in a basket and its broth in a pot, he brought them out and offered them to him under the oak. 
The angel of God said to him, take the meat and the unleavened bread and place them there on this rock and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread with the tip of his staff that he was carrying in his hand. Fire flared out from the rock and consumed the meat and the bread. And then the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Alas, sovereign Lord! I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But then, but the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid. You are not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it the Lord is peace. To this day it stands in Ophrah of the Abizurites. That same night the Lord said to him, Take the second bull from your father's herd, the one that is seven years old. Tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. And then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God at the top of this height. Using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down, offer the second bull as a burnt offering. So Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord told him. But because he was afraid of his family and the townspeople, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. In the morning, when the people of the town got up, there was Baal's altar demolished with the Asherah pole beside it, cut down, and the second bull sacrificed on the newly built altar. They asked each other, who did this? When they carefully investigated, they were told, Gideon, son of Joash, did this, did it. The people of the town demanded of Joash, bring, down, bring out your son, he must die, because he has broken down Baal's altar and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. But Joash replied to the hostile crowd around him, Are you going to plead Baal's cause? Are you trying to save him? Whoever fights for him shall be put to death by the morning. If Baal really is a god, then he can defend himself when someone breaks down his altar. So because Gideon broke down Baal's altar, they gave him the name Jerob Baal that day, saying, Let Baal contend with him. Wow. See, the Israelites that were doing this, they had no clue that the reason why they were so impoverished and their nation was being overrun and destroyed was because they had given themselves over to the worship of Baal, and yet they were ready to kill Gideon when Gideon decided that he was going to tear down the altar. Brothers and sisters, in the realm of spiritual warfare, we're going to fight spiritual battles you wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of darkness and high places. In the realm of spiritual warfare, the first step in deliverance from the Midianite power that pillages our spiritual promised land is to recognize that our oppression and the withdrawal of God's blessing upon us was brought about by our own sins, both individually and collectively. And because of our sins, the sins of our own house and the sins of a community, we have often been overrun and robbed by our spiritual enemies and lay impoverished in a beaten, broken state when we should be risen and powerful and shining like stars in the universe as we hold out the word of life. So often, the church is in this broken, beaten down state. Why? Because of the compromise. And when God intervenes and says, stop the compromise, he the first thing he's going to ask us to do is destroy the altars. Destroy the altars. Man of God, woman of God, rise. Rise, mighty warriors in the Lord. Break down the altars. Remove them from the high places of your life. This is the call of the Lord your God. He will give you the power to do it, not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit of the Lord. The enemy needs to be routed out of our land. And we need to rise and become the people of God that he has called us to be. Gideons of the Lord. It is time for us to recognize how when we allow idols to become partnered with us in our worship of God, and part of our lives is offered to all, all these idols, and part of our uh, uh, worship is offered to God, we will be impoverished. We will not have peace or joy. We will live in abstract fear. 
Oh my. So the first step in obeying the Lord is to identify the altars. I'm not going to say what the altars are because everybody has different things, but there's some common ones. There's some common ones. We offer our children to the, to the world instead of to Christ. We participate in immoral worship of the flesh rather than the worship of God. Those are two. Baal and Asherah, right there. But there's others. Anything that we hold in higher regard over God in our lives is, in fact, an idol. And the altars on the high places, it means the most important part of our lives, the part of our lives where, where everything is seen. The part of our lives, the highest part of our lives. Those altars need to be demolished. It doesn't matter if dad and mom are doing it or have set up those altars in our families. It doesn't matter if grandma or grandpa has or your, your next door neighbors or the people of the village or the community of believers. It doesn't matter. If an altar is identified by God in our hearts, we need to come against it in the name of Jesus. Rise, almighty warriors. Tear down the altars. Humble our, let us humble ourselves before the hand of God and cry out to him for help like those people, but not just recognize that the reason why we have brokenness is, is, is just because someone else has done something, but recognize the things that we have done. Oh, man. I know this is a really heavy word. I struggled in preparation because I know this is heavy, and I don't know everything that's going on in everybody's lives. I don't know. I know what's going on in our lives, in our family. God is calling us to get serious with him. We want to, if we want the Midianites to be overthrown, we're going to have to stand, and we're even going to have to face the lions that come at us when they're angry because we've torn down the altar of Baal. These people wanted Gideon's head. They wanted his death. And his father, even his father was the one who had set up the Asherah pole and the altar to Baal. He says, well, well, if Baal is even a god, then he can contend with him. Okay. God does not leave us alone. See, when God calls Gideons, he doesn't just kind of, kind of call them. There's a visitation that comes from the Lord of hosts. The Lord speaks to us. And he speaks to us through his word today. It's time to tear down the altars. And it's not by might. It's not by power. But it's by the spirit of the Lord that any altar is going to be torn down. But go in the strength that you have. You might not think you're a mighty warrior. You might not think you can stand. But you know what? God doesn't need you to do his bidding. He doesn't need me to do his bidding either. He could use a donkey to say the same things that I say. He could use anything he wants to do the same things that we do. But God isn't like that. He loves us. We're his children. And he wants us as a good father to participate with him in his good work. So he calls us by name. He calls us. The angel of the Lord calls us and says, consecrate your lives to me and watch as I route them before you. In Colossians, and I'll end with reading the scripture this morning, 15 to 20. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him are all in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was 
pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. This is the angel of the Lord whom we serve. He is above all things. There is nothing that's impossible for him. You may be hiding in some kind of wine press from the enemy, concerned that he's going to steal what little you have. But the Lord has called today to his people to stand up, to put away the idols, to deal a death blow to the high places, and instead to build an altar to him in honor of him. And when you do this, we're going to find out next week what the result is. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you care so very much about us. You're closer than the mention of your name. Lord, we thank you that these old covenant stories show us your character, that you never give up on us, Lord, even though we're sinners, Lord. You died for us. You saved us. Father, you made yourself known to us. God, we pray that you would have your way in our lives, that, Father, that you'd help us to see areas where the enemy maybe has been given ground. And, Lord, we know that there's nothing in our own strength that we can do to rout the Midianite enemy of our spirit in our promised land. But, Lord, you have sent us a message. You called us to repent and to turn to you and to arise and to tear down the altars of Baal. So this morning, God, we ask that you'd help us. We can't do this on our own. Would you take our lives and let them be consecrated, Lord, to thee? Take our hands and our feet. Take us where you want us to go. Tell us what you want to do. We will obey your marching orders, O oh Lord. Forgive us, Father, for the times where we stray, where we do things on our own, where we rely upon things that seem right to us and disregard your word. Bring us close to your side, O oh Lord, we pray. May your grace rest upon us. Lord, may your peace rest upon us in abundance that we might live, live a life that is glorifying to you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. After the service, we have a potluck lunch. You're invited to come if you're new here. Don't worry. We'd love to meet you and have, have a lunch with you. Amen. God bless you.